Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Gareth Vaughan and I'm joined by Rod Carr, who's the Chairman of the Climate Change Commission. Welcome, Rod, and thanks for joining us. Now you've Hi, Gareth. Here. Thank you. You've recently sent a letter to Climate Change Minister James Shaw and you've copied in other ministers, including Finance Minister Grant Robertson. And in this, you are talking about um, as the government turns its mind to an economic recovery um, after the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we encourage you to put a climate change lens across the measures you choose to implement. And you've given six principles that you, you think should be followed. Now, um, this is, is interesting and um, obviously comes at a time where we, we're dealing with a public health crisis and we are heading into, or we're already in, um, probably the biggest economic downturn that any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. I, um, the, the Ministry of Social Development figures last week, for example, showed 1.6 million workers already getting the government's wage subsidies. And obviously when the lockdown lifts, not all of their jobs are going to come back, unfortunately. So I guess the, the first question for you is that in the short to medium term, once we're out of lockdown, jobs are going to be the key focus and, and probably any type of jobs. It's, it's an election year as well. So I guess with that as the backdrop, would it not be appropriate for climate change issues to perhaps not be top of everyone's minds? So Gareth, I think the first thing is to absolutely acknowledge the circumstances that the country finds itself in and the emergency interventions that the government using its balance sheet um, is doing on behalf of all New Zealanders to create and uh, maintain uh, employment opportunities. That there is an emergency phase in which getting cash into people's bank accounts so that they can pay their rent, buy their groceries uh, and clothe their kids is, is absolutely critical. And I don't think anybody should be in any doubt that we're still in that emergency and immediate response stage. So what the Climate Change Commission was doing is saying that that emergency and response stage will in time uh, become a more sustained need for the government to support employment, jobs uh, in the economy as the rest of the economy globally and locally recovers. And so the climate change had a bit of the luxury of not having to respond to the emergency and being able to help government and New Zealanders by putting some principles in place that don't make it a choice, that make it a two for one that if we look at the inevitable government spending that will be made to support the economy in the months and even years ahead, that that investment can not only stimulate the economy and support New Zealanders and their livelihoods, but it can also better prepare New Zealanders in the future for both the effects of climate change and to reduce our dependence on high emitting technologies. So. It's not an either or, and it absolutely acknowledges that what's going on today, this week, this month, is about the emergency and the immediate response. So in outlining its six principles of the climate change lens, the commission said, first up, when you make these investments, do it with the climate impacts in mind. That's the mitigation of emissions that are causing the problem and adaptation to the inevitable consequences of the damage we've already done. Secondly, not only look at what you would choose to do differently, but also accelerate what we have to do anyway. Bring forward things that might have been done over five, seven, or 10 years, and do them in the next two, three, four, five years. And again, that may be emissions reduction, or it may be adaptation. Thirdly, quite importantly, do this in partnership. Don't assume that mandarins in Wellington or the markets alone will solve these problems, that we need partnerships between central and local government, between government agencies and the private sector, between iwi Māori, and those partnerships need to help us do different things better, faster. That the fourth part is prepare the labour force, make sure that we develop in this time the skills and capabilities we need to run a low emissions economy in the 21st century. We're going to find young New Zealanders in particular will find it more challenging to find first jobs 
We know that more young people will go and seek further training and education when the labour market is tough. Let's make sure that they have the opportunity to learn contemporary relevant skills to deploy in a low emissions economy. Let's make sure that we maintain the incentives that we already have, whether it's through the emissions trading scheme, whether it's through trying to subsidize the right things and discourage the wrong things, maintain and develop incentives. And the sixth of the principles was make sure when we measure our success, we measure things that matter. So thinking about the carbon footprint of our investments, the lock-in that we might make. It's not all about GDP and busyness. It is about doing things that will make New Zealand a more climate change resilient society and will better play our part in reducing global emissions. Okay, so obviously we've, we've effectively shut down big chunks of our economy with this lockdown. So you're not necessarily saying that we should when we come, come back and switch the lights back on, we should just immediately try and do things differently. You're not necessarily saying that. No, because society changes with hopefully less disruption than we've seen in the last six weeks, but we need to accelerate the rate of change in the direction of emitting less CO2 equivalent gases and adapting our infrastructure to be resilient to the effects of climate change on New Zealand communities. Now on um, carbon emissions, we've obviously seen during this crisis footage on videos and TVs and photos of cities around the world. And I'm thinking China, India, also I saw one in, of LA recently and a story about Auckland about, about showing and telling us how much cleaner our air is because we're not driving to work every day at the moment. Now, obviously, there's a movement underway towards electric vehicles. In New Zealand, it's been pretty slow to date. Um, is there a case, perhaps, in your principle, too, about bringing forward transformational climate change investments for the government to step in and boost subsidies on electric vehicles and try and push us in the direction that we're supposedly heading in anyway? But then, on the other hand, government gets a lot of tax money from petrol and diesel and they will be needing every dollar they can get um, to fund the economic stimulus and uh, the measures they're taking to keep the economy going and get it going again. So is that a bit of a dilemma or is there some solution you would see there where they could um, push forward with an example of your principle too? So I think there are a number of really interesting concepts in that little bundle of goodies. I mean, the, the, the first thing to observe is that <clears throat> the work that the Climate Change Commission is doing will create the evidence base to inform choices about specific reduction plans, but it's a little early to be speaking on behalf of the Commission about what will happen. That said, the Interim Committee on Climate Change provided a report on electrification, and we have inherited that body of work and many of its authors. So it's not unreasonable to assume that electrification is one of the significant opportunities for New Zealand to reduce its emissions, provided the electrification is powered by renewable energy sources. So there's not much point in converting everybody to electric vehicles and then firing up the coal-fired power stations to provide the electricity. So the investments that need to be made in New Zealand are a significant investment to increase our renewable energy production, a significant investment to upgrade essentially the way we move the energy from where it is produced to where it is used, and that's every step of the chain, whether it's the high voltage transmission lines, it's the local distribution, it's the recharging points for an EV fleet. So it's not just about buying the cars. It's a matter of making sure that the renewable energy generation is in place, the distribution of that energy is in place, and then that the technologies that people have to choose from are reliable and competitively priced. So I think that whole chain then leads you to want to both discourage the importation of new high emitting vehicles, as well as encourage the adoption of low or zero emitting vehicles. So hybrids 
and EVs are part of a new suite of vehicles. In that process, then we will reduce a very significant part of our non-agricultural emissions. So about 40% of our non-agricultural CO2 equivalent, the CO2s, actually comes out of our transportation. So you're right to focus on that as one of the opportunities. But it is more complicated than just getting more New Zealanders to buy EVs. There is also the challenge that we face with the low oil price. It is very unhelpful that the oil price has effectively collapsed because alternative technologies essentially were becoming commercially attractive when oil was priced at $45 to $65 a barrel. Maybe there is the opportunity for the government to take some additional taxes from oil as part of stabilizing the oil price for New Zealand consumers and using some of that revenue to support New Zealand households to get energy efficiency in their, in their household use or in their motor vehicle use. That's an interesting idea, but I, I think um, if the government was to increase taxes on petrol, for example, um, in an economic, well, in a recession, frankly, with an election looming, that would be a very brave political call, wouldn't it? Of course, it depends entirely what they do with the revenue. Um, sure, tax increases are never favoured at any point in the economic cycle. But at the moment, many people haven't even benefited from the lower oil price because we haven't been driving anywhere. So it hasn't been baked into household spending plans. We are going to have to make some hard choices here to incentivize switching fast from high emitting technologies, whether it's the coal-fired boiler, whether it's the uh, coal used to dry milk powder for export, whether it's your and my choice about our home heating system, or whether it is how much we pay for our transport. There are no easy, simple silver bullets for the transformation to meet the inevitable impacts of climate change. Just around that whole transport picture that you, you painted there, there would need to be a lot of investment to, to um, create all of these parts to it that you've, that you've, that you've discussed there. Um, would there be a lot of jobs in doing that? And how would we incentivize people to, to move ultimately to, uh, you know, I mean, ultimately it comes down to cost, doesn't it? I mean, obviously most of us um, are concerned about looking after the environment and improving the environment, but in a, a time of high unemployment, cost is going to be pretty important too. Yeah, so I think the first thing is to, to say that the electrification uh, project is a long-term program that could be accelerated that does require high technical skills in many parts. But, but that's not the only program or projects which might be available or sensible to deploy over the next couple of years. It is pretty clear that efficiency in the use of our energy, however it is generated, is also important. If we can be more efficient in how we heat our homes, then we will have more electricity left over and less fossil fuel polluting by households, so the electrification will require less new infrastructure than it might otherwise have needed. So, for example, home insulation, which is a program of work already well supported, is a widely distributed employment opportunity for appropriately trained and supervised people that has health benefits for homeowners, it has energy efficiency and cost savings for homeowners, and that would be a sensible type of program for the government to consider investing in as part of its economic stimulus with an eye to the long-term future of New Zealand. A couple of our key industries have been in, in focus for different reasons um, during this lockdown. Um, one of them, obviously, tourism, which with air travel almost completely dead at the moment. Um, obviously, tourism is, 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 as well is basically dead at the moment. 
Um, what's your long-term view on tourism for New Zealand? It's obviously been very important to our economy in recent years, but it has come with an impact on our economy. How do we reboot tourism? So tourism is fascinating. The Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment made the observation that we couldn't continue simply to do more of what we were doing in tourism, that, that we were degrading the experience of the international visitors. Um, we were creating significant impacts in local, provincial and rural communities as a result of the infrastructure strain that was being placed. Um, and was really sounding the alarm that we could not go on simply doing what we were doing, let alone doing more of it the same way. Uh, the setback that we have now had gives us a very significant opportunity to think precisely what kind of tourist sector do we want in New Zealand. And maybe we should be running it more along the lines of one large national park where we do actually sell licenses for people to come and tour New Zealand and control admission, ad, admission at the gate rather than all comers at any price level to go anywhere to do anything uh, that they might choose to do. I think we'll find that domestic tourism does build back a little, uh, but it's not going to replace the four million international tourists a year that were coming into New Zealand. I hope that sooner than rather than later, we will form a bubble with our near neighbor to the west, Australia, and that that will provide stimulus for both sides of the Tasman's tourist industry. But I think we're going to have to think again, pretty hard about the environmental footprint of tourism and the emissions associated with bringing tourists from all around the world to come here. I think there are opportunities uh, for research and development in the medium term for short haul electric flight that certainly doesn't appear to address the long haul issues and challenges. There is certainly a lot of research and some potential in biofuels, but here we have the challenge of the now substantially lower oil price, which makes the gap between the cost of biofuels and fossil fuels uh, even higher. We need to put an appropriate price on those emissions. And certainly uh, the international airline industry has got a stream of work around how emissions from airliners might be first measured, then managed, and ultimately reduced. Agriculture was the other of our key industries I wanted to ask you about. Um, now, obviously agriculture has been in the news a lot in recent years, especially the dairy farming side of it for its impact on the environment. But nonetheless, um, we're still a good food producer and even in recessions, people need to eat in other parts of the world. So do we, what do we do with our food production going forward? I mean, do, do we potentially increase it? Because it's a, a good industry for New Zealand that makes us money and creates jobs. But then again, it doesn't necessarily do a, uh, it's not necessarily good for our, our environment if we do that. So there's a bit of a dilemma there. What's your, what's your thinking around that? So I think the starting point is to, to acknowledge that the agricultural sector in New Zealand um, is not only significant, but is also shown over 100 years to be quite flexible and responsive, and its best strength is in its diversity. So we have seen in the last 20 years a very substantial investment in dairying, uh, and that is, has resulted in emissions and a footprint for dairying that has not been as carefully managed as we now know and understand it needs to be. But I have every confidence that the sector is aware of that and is investing and developing talent to manage their emissions and reduce them per unit of output. That, that you're absolutely right to observe that the world is hungry and needs access to affordable food and that New Zealand has a capacity to produce that food for the world. So choking off our agricultural sector is not in the world's interest and neither is it in New Zealand's interests. On the other hand, it is important that we make progress in doing the science, running the development, and ultimately deploying 
technologies in agriculture that will reduce emissions per unit of output. If we can do that, we will be playing our part in addressing climate change. Well, look, thanks a lot for that, Rod. That's Rod Carr, Chairman of the Climate Change Commission, and I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz. Thanks, Gareth. Appreciate the opportunity.